This is the nature of things. It's been one of the most compelling international mysteries of the last 170 years. What happened to a British naval expedition searching for the Northwest Passage? What happened to Sir John Franklin, his two ships, and 129 men? And it's into that maze that Franklin disappears. Finally, last summer, one of the ships was found. I mean, I lunged forward and said, that's it, that's it. But what does it tell us about the fate of Franklin's men? I think they closed the ship up, left it in good order, and set out in an attempt to save themselves. Now, the exclusive inside story of how they found the Erebus. In 2014, an extraordinary expedition of intrepid explorers with high-tech equipment made a startling discovery in the Arctic. In uncharted waters, scans revealed a wrecked ship, HMS Erebus. This intriguing find could add new layers to an enduring Canadian mystery. It's 2014, the sixth year that Parks Canada has had their crack underwater archaeology team searching for Sir John Franklin's lost expedition. The captivating thing that is the Canadian Arctic, coupled with this doomed expedition of exploration and, uh, and shipwrecks, uh, so it makes for, uh, a, I think, a story that everyone can uh, identify with. These shipwrecks are national historic sites. What that says is that they are, they have been recognized as part of a story that is among the most important stories of the country. The ships hadn't even been found, and already they were national historic sites. That's because the Erebus and the Terror as long as they were missing, left a huge gap in Canada's Arctic story. If Franklin's ships and their 129 men had made it from one end of the Arctic Ocean to the other, they might never have been as legendary as they are today. They are famous for vanishing. And year after year, it seems that the Arctic has conspired to keep them hidden. It's been a sort of cat and mouse game all along. You know, we, we feel like we have a break. We feel like we have, uh, you know, we have a shot. And then the ice shifts and uh, the door is closed. There's no guarantee that, that what's predicted for the next day is going to happen. So when you're out there and you're saying, OK, it's not working out today, but, you know, if we get a bit of wind, or if it changes, it's a whole different ballgame. What if, what if the vessel isn't intact? What if it's uh, been smashed by the ice and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's scattered timbers that we're trying to find? These are the questions that lingered after five empty summers of searching. So in 2014, everyone was on deck. The Coast Guard, the Navy, the Arctic Research Foundation, the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, the Canadian Hydrographic Service, the Canadian Ice Service. And the Prime Minister really wanted these guys to find the ship. It was obviously very significant to him uh, personally. Uh, you could see uh, he had uh, taken a keen interest. So we're hoping that there's going to be a payday uh, down the road here. The Erebus and the Terror. They had served in wartime. And they had gone exploring. Both sailed to the Antarctic before they were sent north.
58-year-old Sir John Franklin was a decorated rear admiral with a contentious reputation. He had served in British naval battles, but he also led a disastrous overland expedition through the Canadian North in an earlier attempt to find the passage. He was a controversial choice, and there were rumblings that his health was something of a concern. Still, in 1845, he was the Admiralty's man. There certainly wasn't any question that Franklin had the right ships. The Erebus and Terror were state-of-the-art, refitted with steam engines and retractable propellers, central heating, enough food to last over three years, and a library and amusements to help pass the long winter Arctic nights. There had never been an Arctic expedition outfitted like this one. It really caught the imagination of the public because this was going to be the one. It's kind of like Chris Hatfield flying around the earth, you know. It was, uh, it was something, a spectacular display of uh, technological progress. And it, I mean, how could it possibly fail? All precautions had been taken to make sure nothing went wrong. The British Navy would be the first to navigate the Northwest Passage to Asia and would then have a stranglehold on trade to the east. They felt, well, look, it's going to be a piece of cake. Uh, we're going to send Franklin in. All he has to do is join this northern channel with the southern channel and uh, he's gonna emerge into the Pacific uh, trailing clouds of glory. In 1845, Franklin is sailing north with charts, and that is all the information he has. Others have been to parts of the Arctic that he's going to before him, so there is some knowledge, but actually Franklin's instructions are clear. He has to sail beyond the known world, sail into the heart of that map that at the moment is an appealing blank. Mm -hmm. There's a myriad, a maze of islands, and it's into that maze that Franklin disappears. Whalers were the last to see the ships sailing north past Greenland towards Lancaster Sound. We only know where they went next by the sparse bits of evidence they left behind. The first clue three graves on Beachy Island. It would have been awful to lose three crewmen, but there was no indication that the expedition itself was in any kind of trouble, yet. It's tragic, but it's also the first proof that this is where Franklin and his men have been. In the spring of 1846, Franklin made his play for the passage by heading south towards this strait that cuts between King William Island and Victoria Island. We know this because of clue number two, a note left behind in a cairn giving the latitude and longitude of the Erebus and Terror. It indicated that all was well in May 1847. It was standard naval practice to issue these kind of notes with uh, a standard blank form that would be filled in when necessary. The notes were then placed in tubes like these. They could be just left for people to find information about the expedition. By this point, we can assume that the men were more hardened by the Arctic weather as they entered their second winter. Officers would have kept them busy. The ship's bells would have rung out each half hour on the half hour, marking time across the expanse of pack ice. But with clue number three comes the first sign of trouble, real trouble. 
In the spring of 1848, Franklin's senior officers, Francis Crozier and James Fitzjames, went back and reopened the cairn where they had left the note the previous year and scribbled a startling addendum around the margins. <coughs> Franklin was dead, along with nine other officers and 15 men. The surviving crew members were going to try to make it out of the Arctic on foot. What killed Franklin? And how was a crew of 129 cut down to 105? There were no explanations. That vague note was the last correspondence the crew left behind. Every other physical clue that's been found since, bones, lifeboats, and artifacts, indicate carnage, deprivation, and prolonged horrible misery. Whatever happened, it's fair to speculate that the ice had something to do with it. Even 170 years later, Victoria Strait is virtually impassable. You see how it's extended down uh, almost, it's touching now Jenny Lind Island, right? Yeah. Where the green is, we can navigate that. The team received satellite ice images from the Canadian Space Agency. This stuff was thick. Even an icebreaker had trouble carving a path. It's been an unusually uh, um, cold um, summer, and last winter was quite severe, so the extent of the ice cover is uh, problematic for us. In some odd way, this is as it should be. This is a lot closer to what Franklin was dealing with. Winds and currents forced the ice into a bottleneck between Victoria and King William Islands. It's always bad here, as bad in 2014 as it probably was in 1846. Just imagine trying to navigate this in a 19th century wooden ship. That note from the cairn gave the latitude and longitude of where the men left the ships. From what little information the note contained, we can deduce that the ships had been stuck in the ice for a year and a half before the men decided to leave. At that point of time, you wonder, did, did anyone maintain any realistic hope of ever seeing home again? You know, hauling these incredibly heavy ships' boats on sledges with uh, everything they thought they might uh, need to survive. They had to know that they were, their chances of making it were very slim. Well, we can, well, we can, yeah. First thing is to we go out there the and ship, we can exactly. lead the ship in with the rest. The team drew up a search zone, starting with the area where the ships were abandoned, then spreading south to where the pack ice may have carried the ships away. That narrowed things down, but still the Arctic is huge, and finding sunken ships, even ships as substantial as the Erebus or the Terror, was a tall order. Luckily, the 2014 expedition had plenty of high-tech toys. They used sonars to scan the ocean floor, most of which had never been mapped before. We are still, like in the 19th century, trying to find our way through some of these Arctic mazes. So in 2014, there's still a lot to learn about the Arctic seafloor. They saw where ice had scoured the seabed. That's not a good sign, because if a shipwreck came to rest here, it could have been pulverized. The team pored over every single image that appeared on screen. It was mind-numbing work, but they needed to be on the lookout for pieces of a ship. To this point, no luck. 
not one splinter of wood. The incredibly brief Arctic summer didn't give them any breaks. You've put all that effort, you've got that amazing technology, everybody's around, we're all eager to get into the search, and it's, the conditions are just not there. So, um, yeah, so it's, 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 it was, it's quite frustrating, but that's, that's the way the Arctic decided. And the news got worse. The sea ice coalesced, got thicker, more dangerous. They had to make a call, stay here, or try to salvage the summer by searching somewhere else. It turned out that the Arctic made the decision for them. They were pushed to the southern cert zone. The ice cover was uh, frustrating. We held out hope uh, that it might ultimately clear. So uh, it was with a bit of disappointment that we uh, proceeded uh, to the southern search area in, instead. Then you get here and you realize that th this is why it, Erebus and Terror have not been found. It, it's a very difficult part of the world to operate in. If it were easy, it would have been done uh, many, many years ago. You know, um, maybe we'll get lucky. They could use some luck. And the Arctic stepped in to give it to them, sending the expedition in the same direction it had forced Franklin's men more than a century and a half ago. By 1848, the Admiralty knew something had gone terribly wrong. No one had heard anything from the Franklin expedition for three years. Naval ships started heading towards the Canadian Arctic. The quest for the Northwest Passage had turned into a rescue mission. They're getting into crisis mode. They're sending expeditions out, not one ship, but two, and then soon a whole a uh, flotilla, a squadron of vessels. By 1854, the Navy had to acknowledge that no survivors of the Franklin expedition would ever be found. And then suddenly, shocking news from Canada. An explorer named Dr. John Ray came to London with a story gathered from Inuit hunters. He makes his report to the Hudson's Bay Company and to the Admiralty, and he lays it all out. The Times gets hold of his report, and boom. And here's John Ray's letter uh, in all its gory detail. The bodies of some 30 persons were discovered on the continent and five on an island. <laughs> Some were in a tent or tents, others under the boat, which had been turned to form a shelter. And several lay scattered about in different directions. They talked about uh, cannibalism, that the white man had eventually died and there was a lot of evidence that, you know, they'd started to eat each other, you know, the dead bodies. That kind of news was treated with the utmost scorn in Britain. There was no cannibalism in the British Navy. And Victorian England just could not cope because they knew who had gone out the cream of the British Royal Navy, the greatest expedition of all time. The backlash against Ray came from the highest levels of London society. No one was more brutal than Charles Dickens. And Dickens is incensed. He insults the Inuit testimony. They had no reason to lie, but nonetheless, he dismisses their evidence as the 
uncivilised chatter of a gross handful of people with a domesticity of blood and blubber. This is a clavicle or collarbone with three very distinct cut marks. Forensic anthropologist Anne Keenleyside has done extensive work on a collection of Franklin Expedition bones discovered on King William Island in the 1990s. The first bone in which I identified a cut mark was a left pelvic bone. I turned it over, uncovered it, lifted it up from the soil, and found a distinct cut mark, clearly identifiable as a mark that was not made by an animal. These kinds of human-made cut marks tend to have a V-shaped cross-section, depending on the shape of the blade. They're very distinctive from animal tooth marks. We tend to think of cut marks appearing in areas where you are engaged in defleshing. So, for example, in the shaft of the humerus or perhaps cut marks uh, in the shaft of the femur, the thigh bone. And we did find cut marks in some of those locations. The Inuit were right and it became clear that their stories about Franklin's men were the most accurate accounts anyone could rely on. Oral history is our science. It's the science of Inuit. That's how we learn about where to go and get the food, or you may know about these ice conditions in the springtime. Oral history had to be very, very accurate because if it was not, it could mean death. King William Island. It's always been the center of the search for Franklin, and the Inuit say they saw the ships frozen offshore here. They also said they saw one of them sink. The Inuit said the other ship got carried away further south by the ice. Bernier and Harris went south too, many kilometers from where they started earlier this summer. Maybe the Arctic is trying to tell them something. The Inuit stories described a single ship frozen in near here, but it didn't appear to be deserted. The gangplank had been lowered and there was smoke coming out of the chimney. How could this be? Perhaps the answer lies in what else the Inuit saw. Remember the note that Crozier and Fitzjames left behind in the cairn. The note said the men were heading south on foot in a desperate attempt to survive. Several years later, a search party found one of the lifeboats well inland on King William Island, loaded on a hauling sledge. Here is an image as imagined by an American illustrated newspaper that confirms their worst fears. Here is the true horror of uh, this great and miserable discovery of one of the boats that has been pulled by survivors along the coast of King William Island. In this boat, they find objects and they find skeletons. More skeletons were found a trail of bones marking the crew's desperate escape route. Some fell and died in their tracks as the others trudged on. It's been largely assumed that all this happened not long after Franklin's death, and the ship's abandonment in 1848. Until recently, 
The guess had been that the ships both sank, the men fled on foot, and soon after, all of them were dead. That was the Victorian. They marched away as an organized body in a, you know, singing Rule Britannia, and the weakest dropped behind, and then they died. The story. And the Inuit never told that story. They always said it was much more complicated. In fact, the Inuit said they actually made contact with Franklin's men as they searched for food. The leader of the sailors, likely Captain Francis Crozier, pleaded with the hunters to trade for seal meat. The Englishmen were weak, but the Inuit realized they couldn't support a large group of desperate outsiders. So they left. Staying would have threatened their own chances of survival. As for Franklin's men, their fate was set. They were left on their own in the most brutal place on earth. The Inuit accounts are stunningly reliable. So if they said some sailors got back on board one of the ships, it was probably true. It is one of the most inhospitable places, and, and you know, even if you're there in the height of August, uh, <laughs> the best season, you're not getting out of there if you have to walk. Uh, it's just not going to happen. I would bet strongly that some men at least went back to the Erebus and were with it for some time, traveling south. So what if the last of Franklin's men rode one of the ships south and came to rest here? And this was quite clear that, according to the Inuit accounts, the ships were in two areas. One went down in the early stage of, of the post abandonment process, if, if you want. Uh, west of King William Island. The other one went down uh, further south. And was ultimately uh, sunk uh, close to the Adelaide Peninsula. They moved down to the southern search area, not far from the Adelaide Peninsula. The ice choke channel further north gave them nothing, but suddenly, things seem to be breaking in their favor. A helicopter pilot came across a large piece of metal lodged behind a stone on a nearby island. Just walking on the beach, sort of something caught my eye out at the side, and then we're looking around for Doug, and he's like, oh, good find. Yeah. We all looked at it and went, well, this is from a ship. We didn't know what it was. We're not, you know, marine archaeologists per se. We knew that our Parks Canada colleagues were going to be pretty excited to see this. And we're kind of going, no, oh, it's just, it's a shame, really, though, there's no broad arrows that might help make sure this isn't from a barge or something like that. Uh, the palm of my hand was covering the, the broad arrows as we're standing there. And I opened up my hand because we were going to take it up to the helicopter. And we just kind of went, oh, there's, there's not one, there's two uh, beside the number 12. So. Um, that was, you know, we did some high fives and thought, now they're going to be especially interested in seeing, seeing this item. This is part of a davit, a ship's crane. It wouldn't have come off a lifeboat. 
and it's too large and heavy to have been dragged very far from one of the ships. So there was only one conclusion. The Erebus or the Terror must be nearby. This large iron object, very close to where the Inuit report that uh, they encountered one of these ships, to find this in that vicinity is very, very exciting, and it uh, really told us that we were barking up the right tree. Remember that the summer here is short. It was the end of August, and the ice would close in here soon. The difference between another lost season and a monumental discovery was mere hours by this point. It all depended on what the sonar showed them. And then it happened. An incredible sight appeared on their screens. The image of a ship's hull sitting upright in only 11 meters of water. This really unmistakable outline of, of a shipwreck. No doubt what it was. Uh, started to scroll down uh, the monitor. And it wasn't even halfway onto the screen before you really knew what you were looking at. Jabbed my finger at the screen and kind of lunged forward and said, that's it, that's it. When I saw the image of the ship coming down, I just, it cut my legs, literally. Oh my God, this is gonna be a treasure trove of information. Ryan Harris sent down a remote-controlled sub with an onboard camera. They had a shipwreck right beneath their feet. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm on the bow. Okay, I got a good image here. The first murky video images traced the lines of a wooden ship's hull. Geez, I wouldn't believe how much marine growth is on it. Look at the size of these timbers. The condition of the timbers looks uh, exceptionally good. This was early September. Anywhere south would have been beach weather. Here, the tendrils of winter were creeping in. Even so, the Parks Canada team was keen to get in the water. You could feel it getting colder so that I think that helped prepare us for the dive and I remember saying let's not forget that every diver in the world wants to be one of us right now main 3000 right on. pony uh, 21 I had caught a glimpse of the timber on the seafloor all alone, followed along its length, and then just headed off in the, in the, along the same line, and you know, just growing anticipation and excitement, and and then you know, boom. Towering overhead, out of the haze, loomed the bulk of this uh, stately shipwreck, um, full five meters tall. timbers were strewn across the deck. Two six-pounder cannons came into view. This was a British naval ship, there is no doubt. It was uh, difficult to absorb all that information. Everywhere you looked, there was something new and really remarkable. And I'd, I'd keep saying to John, come over, you gotta see this. This is uh, absolutely incredible. And he'd be saying, no, you come over here and come take a look at this. What more proof did they need that it was Franklin's? Well, this piece, a piece more dramatic than anything the team hoped to recover so soon. I hear John call over on the headset saying, you're not gonna believe this, but I, I found the bell. But sure enough, I went over and there was the ship's bell lying in plain sight right on top of the upper deck. The 
ship's bell with the British broad arrow embossed in the brass. No doubt about it, this was one of Sir John Franklin's ships. It's just an absolute remarkable uh, sight. You feel this connection with the past. It's uh, uh, really quite astonishing. You can't help but just being overwhelmed by by what the wreck represents. And once you're underwater, sometimes you have to um, sit back and let the archaeologists go and just get immersed in, in the moment of the discovery. So I think we all did, and that's why we came back saying, this is the best dive I ever did. And for me, it truly was. It was just extraordinary. Right there, one of the world's most coveted shipwrecks. After 170 years, one of Franklin's ships had been found. But how did they figure out which one? A day of uh, some very good news, and that is that uh, we have found one of the two Franklin ships. The Hoopla made international news. They had found one of the ships, but which ship? So knowing where to landmark uh, that length measurement, if we look at the multi-beam. Uh, the best way to figure that out was to go back to the original Royal Navy plans. Right. And uh, you can see the, the outline of the forward hatchway. Ryan Harris laid them over the sonar image. Red as well, it, uh, the outline fits uh, like perfectly. They lined up. It was the Erebus, Franklin's flagship. The match was perfect. That meant this footage from the stern of the wreck could have been a peek inside Franklin's own stateroom. And that, perhaps, was a leg of his table. And as much as the divers were dying to get a good look inside, they couldn't let their curiosity get the better of them. For this year, finding the Erebus was good enough. Way to die. <laughs> that was the best die of my entire life. It's gonna take a lot to beat that one. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's why the, the discovery of the Erebus is so very interesting because where it is vindicates testimony given by the Inuit. So the decking, as we saw, is, is intact underneath the windlass. It certainly suggests uh, a, a revision of the standard reconstruction. The Inuit said some of the crew returned to the Erebus after trying to escape the Arctic on foot. It looks like that might have been what happened. But what happened after that? How did this ship travel so far south? Were there men on board sailing the Erebus? Or was it hauled along by moving ice? So where the uh, wreck of Erebus is found, it actually happens to be protected, almost surrounded by a barrier of, of small islands and islets. What we ask ourselves is how this ship arrived at that location. The Canadian Ice Service data show that in some years in this part of the Arctic, the ice can cover a great distance in a matter of months. So the Erebus could well have been carried here. What uh, is less clear, however, is uh, how it worked itself into a protective pocket where we find it today. It's as if the Erebus was maneuvered and moored in a safe harbor surrounded by shoals and islands that would block the ice. It's hard to say for sure, but this was possibly the fifth winter for the last survivors, stretching into 1850. The Inuit said they were afraid to approach. The previous actions of the British crew had been erratic, even dangerous. After all, 
They had been eating each other. But eventually, any signs of movement on the Erebus ceased, and the Inuit ventured on board to see what they could salvage. As they gathered up useful pieces of metal, they came across a corpse, a giant body by their account. With that discovery, they quickly left with their haul. By the time they came back months later, the Erebus had sunk. On this first dive, the Parks Canada crew did a thorough survey of the Erebus's hull. But the real discoveries and more real answers will come with the next dive season inside the wreck. So what's still in there? How about that giant sailor's body the Inuits say they saw? What about watertight boxes or tubes with accounts of what actually happened? We know the expedition had cameras. Could there be photographs preserved by the frigid water? And where did those final crewmen go? I have great hopes that they left some records behind because that would have been normal practice. You know, they would have soldered them into tin cases and wrapped them in canvas and tarred the canvas to, because, and hoped that somebody would eventually find their ship and know what happened to them. The Inuit saw a few sets of footprints in the snow leading away from the Erebus. It was after that that any signs of life on the ship went still. I think that tells us that they, they left in an orderly manner. The, uh, the final guys who were on the ship this was a deliberate act. They were still in charge of who they were, what they were doing. They had a plan, and they closed the ship up, left it in good order, and set out in an attempt to save themselves. We may never know that part of the story, but judging from the final resting place of the Erebus, the last of Franklin's men may have laid eyes on the waterway to the west, the ultimate goal of the expedition, the Northwest Passage. Now these men, that last surviving band, a final fire before the flame goes out. These men have in effect completed the final link in the chain of the Northwest Passage. If only one crew member had survived, this 170 year long obsession to find out what actually happened to Franklin's expedition would not be the same. It's the fact that they all died, leaving behind only a hint of their fate that compels us. It took scientific discipline, Inuit oral history, and some luck to finally find the Erebus. But the story is far from over. In fact, it's barely begun. We'll be back this summer so you can catch up with the world of the nature of things. If men are animals, are women animals too? Absolutely. Amazing creatures. Who gets to save a species from extinction every day? New science. We're doing 120 clicks, and get this, this car is driving itself. And some intriguing discoveries. Oh my god, this is gonna be a treasure trove of information. This summer on The Nature of Things. First, you have to think, how do you do it? Second, you don't think about it, you hit. Third, you have to get away with it. A personal journey to avoid a devastating disease. Alzheimer's is, to me, the cancer of the 21st century. I'm nervous. I've never had anything like this before. Can online games help? But if people are looking to train their brains, then I don't think it's as easy as they might think it is. Marketplace, Friday at 8 on CBC. Missed your favorite CBC show? Catch up now at cbc.ca.